the sidebar, Bracewell's podcast devoted to government enforcement investigations, corporate compliance, and white-collar criminal defense. I'm Matthew Nielsen. And I'm Seth Ducharme. And we are your host and both partners at Bracewell LLP, where we represent companies, boards of directors, and individuals in all manners of litigation, investigation, and enforcement actions. Welcome to part two of our podcast regarding the failure of Silicon Valley Bank and an overview of the banking industry from our good friend and colleague, Bob Clark, the former comptroller of the U.S. currency. So let's jump in. I really hope it's interesting to our listeners. I mean, it's really interesting for me to, because again, I see all these different types of banks and I really haven't thought a whole lot about you know, what are the real differences of them. But let's kind of jump into kind of what's been happening currently. We made kind of stark news, kind of rattled a lot of people, although it seems to maybe have calmed down a little bit. But, you know, we had a period of a short period of time in which we saw, you know, kind of two significant bank failures, Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank. We saw and, and we can talk a little bit about whether this was related. We saw Credit Suisse have its own issues, although that may have been more, may have been unrelated to the same type of issues that SVB and Signature had, but they ended up having to be acquired by UBS. And I guess there is still a little bit, you know, uncertainty of kind of where the banking industry, how strong our, our banking system is. But look, there's been a lot of written about this, but, you know, kind of throw it to you guys as you've kind of, with your expertise, kind of looked at what's happened. And I know there's going to be a lot more that's going to come out. Talk a little bit about like the timeline of events when were they related to SVB and Signature and and just kind of your impressions of those events and and what appears to be the cause of those bank failures. This was a fascinating time for me to to watch all of this because it was so fast moving. In the case of Silicon Valley Bank, well, really in the case of both of them, but in the case of Silicon Valley Bank, it really started on a Wednesday, and by Thursday. The bank had had lost a substantial portion of its deposit base. And by Friday, the regulators felt like they had to close it. Uh, Silicon Valley Bank was a state-chartered bank. It uh, was part of a holding company, which was regulated by the Fed. And it was also a Fed member bank. So the bank itself was regulated federally by uh, the Fed. And it was regulated on the state level by the California Banking Department. And they got together on... uh, Friday evening and said, we've got to close the bank because we don't think it's going to be able to open on uh, Monday. Silicon Valley Bank was an interesting bank in that 90% of its deposits were uninsured. It was, um, just to nobody's surprise, located in Silicon Valley. And as a consequence, it was it had a tremendous number of uh, high-tech companies, startups, and, and, and big ones who were depositors. Roku, for example, had, you know, 900 million dollars on deposit, some some very huge amount. And the bank had, two or three years ago, had uh, been uh, inundated with deposit. And uh, at, at that time, the interest rates had not started to rise. And so the management of the bank decided that the thing to do was to invest a lot of those deposits in federally insured securities, both treasury bonds and also uh, mortgage-backed securities that were reg- they were guaranteed by Freddie and Fannie. On its surface, that sounds like a very responsible thing to do. Uh, they're very uh, safe securities, and the, and the bank did not have enough loan demand to to make loans with those deposits, and so they uh, they made those investments. The mistake, in hindsight, that they made was that they bought ten year securities, and when the interest rates began to rise, as the Fed began to try to defeat inflation. The value of those securities declined with every interest rate increase to the point that when depositors started leaving the bank, the bank had to do something to create liquidity. I mean, the the basic banking 101 is that banks take in money from depositors and depositors need to have need to feel comfortable that when they want their money back, they can get it. And so when a number of them started demanding to get their money back, Silicon Valley Bank had to sell a number of these securities, uh, which were perfectly safe, but had declined in market value because of their interest rate. And they incurred a $1.8 billion loss in their in their capital account. And, and that just, the word got out about that, and that just fed the fire. And um, the other interesting thing about this failure is that, uh, you know, we haven't had a bank failure since, a significant bank failure since 2008. And in recent times, 
we've we've had uh, the internet and we've had all these social media outfits that everybody subscribes to and the ability to move money out of a bank has improved to the point that you can do it on your iPhone with a touch of a button. And so once the money starts going, it can go very fast. In the case of Silicon Valley Bank, it did go very fast. And uh, the, the regulators at the end of the day on uh, Friday just said, um, this is not going to survive. We need to close it. So they announced they were closing it. And on Friday afternoon, they said, uh, Monday morning, uh, everybody will have access to their insured deposits. And we're going to give all the uninsured depositors a receipt from the receivership that we're creating for the bank. And we'll try to give them a, a dividend So, because some of them had payroll they had to meet. And we'll try to give them an advanced dividend, but we're not going to give them all their uninsured money back. So everybody was in a panic on Friday night and Saturday morning saying, what are we going to do on Monday? How are we going to get our money out? And uh, I was fascinated by this because I was watching it all with great interest because it, it brought back lots of memories. And I said to myself, they may think that they're going to give everybody a receivership certificate for their uninsured deposits, but they're going to think about it a little bit more over the weekend, and they're going to conclude that if they do that, if they don't protect those uninsured deposits, we're going to have a run like nobody's ever seen before on Monday morning, or at least there's a high risk that that will happen. So as I think people know, the the government stepped in and said, we're going to protect all of the deposits, all the uninsured depositors. So that there won't be any, there won't be any reason for people to continue to withdraw money from uh, from banks. We're going to we're going to send a message to the market that we're protecting deposits. On Sunday, Signature Bank, which was regulated by the New York Banking Department, it also was a state bank. The regulators, and it also was a Fed member bank. The regulators got together and said, we don't think Signature Bank is going to be able to open on Monday morning because there have been so many withdrawals during the week preceding. And there's so many people that have given notice that they intend to continue to withdraw that uh, we're going to close that bank too. And they decided to protect those uninsured deposits. So that, that, uh, is the, that's the timeline for what happened. And the cause is simply that the, the both banks did not take the kind of precautions they should have taken to get their liquidity in balance better uh, when they saw that interest rates were going up. Uh, a lot of people said they made a big mistake buying long long bonds, 10-year 10 10 year bonds. Uh, in retrospect, they did, but that doesn't mean that they couldn't have taken some actions to mitigate the losses in that bond portfolio. They could have bought swaps. They could have had other, they could have lightened up on the, when they saw that interest rates were going to start going up, they could have sold some of those securities, taken a very small loss on them, and reinvested them in short-term securities that could have been sold, or they could have invested them in more liquid things even than than securities, just to make sure that they had enough uh, liquidity in case it was needed. The other thing they didn't seem to focus on was the fact that they had an inordinately large amount of uninsured deposit. And so an uninsured deposit can just disappear when, when the money's either needed for something or when the depositor loses confidence in the bank. And in this case, some of the, some of the depositors needed the money, but mostly most of them just lost confidence in the bank. And it was really easy to move the money. And so they did. Well, and, it, and it seemed like this was an unusual situation because I, I read that Silicon Valley Bank had like 35,000 customers. And you think, okay, well, there's 35,000 different viewpoints. But the reality of it is, is that the way in which Silicon Valley as a region, not the bank, operates is that you have venture capital firms and funds that essentially control a lot of different companies. And so instead of really having 35,000 companies making independent decisions, you really, those 35,000 companies were really controlled by a very few amount of firms. And so you had a situation where it only took a cup, you know, a few firms losing confidence and they had a exponential impact on the withdrawals because they're withdrawing for all of the companies that they're controlling rather than just one company. Right. And it was a con- definitely a contributing factor. 
So I guess the question, I mean, there's obviously some pointing that can be at the bank management, but also, I mean, I guess wouldn't, wouldn't regulators be thinking about this? Like, you know, Hey, you guys have a tremendous amount of uninsured deposits. You seem to be really long on treasuries and, you know, we've been steadily increasing the interest rates, which have been causing the value of those securities to go down. I mean, this, you know, that didn't happen overnight. You know, there's been some criticism there. I mean, do you, I mean, without knowing any of the details, it, it sounds like that may be fair criticism. Well, I think it is fair criticism. Having been a regulator myself, I tend to, to be more supportive of regulators yeah. when there's a bank failure because it's always uh, the first people who get blamed for a bank failure is the regulator. Well, why did, why did you let the bank fail? And the, the proper response is, look, we don't manage banks. Uh, the regulators don't manage banks. Those are, those are managed by the, the management of the bank and by the board of directors of the bank. And all we can do is uh, try to point out the deficiencies when we do examinations. But that's not really all regulators can do. And this is an in- interesting case where I think the regulators fell down in their responsibility on, on these two, particularly Silicon Valley Bank. The Fed regulators, the San Francisco Federal Reserve Bank, which is the the bank examiners in that in that bank, had the primary responsibility for overseeing uh, Silicon Valley. They identified the problem in the bank, the the imbalance of the the long with the long bonds and the and the large number of um, large amount of uninsured deposit. They identified that as late as uh, 2021 in the fall of 2021. And then they came in, in in the spring of 2022, as I understand it, and did an examination and wrote the bank up with, uh, I don't want to get too technical here, but when the bank examiners go in and do, a, do an exam report, they have something called matters requiring attention. And then they also have matters requiring immediate attention. And those are really for the benefit of the management and for the board. And what it is, what it amounts to is the examiner saying, look, these are the things that you need to fix. And they gave them a half a dozen or more things that they needed to fix in uh, the spring of 2022. And then apparently they had a meeting with the, with the board and with the management of the bank in the fall uh, of 2022. And I would assume that that was a pretty tough meeting. I mean, if it had been with a group of OCC examiners that I'm been more familiar with, it would have been a tough meeting and they would have said, you, you've got to get this fixed or we're going to have to take some serious action. What can the serious action be? Well, I mean, it can be everything from a cease and desist order, which you do not want your bank to be subjected to. It can be fines to the management or to the even to the board members. It can be removal. The, the regulators actually have the ability under egregious circumstances and a, a failure of management to respond to deficiencies that have been pointed out to uh, the bank management several times actually would be grounds for removal of uh, a, a management team or an individual person from the bank. So the, the regulators have a club that they can that they can whack the, the bank management over the head with. And what is amazing to me is that they didn't they didn't take some more severe action when it appeared that the bank wasn't doing anything about solving the problem, trying to prevent the problem. So I really don't have a, I'm not very sympathetic to the regulators who say, well, it's really the management's fault. Yes, it is the management's fault, but it's also the regulators' fault because they, it's not like they didn't see the problem. They just didn't, they weren't strong enough in what they did about the problem. Yeah. I mean, that's their, that's their responsibility. I mean, assuming the management was acting in good faith, you know, a lot of times you don't see the, you know, the size or, or the complete scope of the risk of your actions, right? And that's why you need, you know, the regulators to come in with an objective viewpoint and, and say, listen, we're, you know, we're concerned about, you know, the actions you're taking and, and, and actions you're not, actions you're not taking and you need, you need to change that. So. Well, I've been on both sides of the fence. I've, I've, I've been a banking lawyer, but I've also been a bank investor and a bank board member. And I can assure you that when the regulator comes in, and says, you got a problem with this and this and this, every bank I've been involved with, uh, the board of directors has said to the management, you need to fix every single one of those things and we want to know how you're going to do it and by when you're going to get it done. And uh, I'm amazed that this bank was not more responsive. Hmm. So I'm sure there's a lot of detail associated with it, but you know, we talked a little bit about closing banks. These banks were closed. Talk a little bit, I mean, what what exactly happens? I mean, what leads to the closing of a bank? What happens when that occurs? Well, the, the, what leads to it, of course, is just that the bank becomes either illiquid, which means it can't meet the demand of depositors, which was the case 
in uh, Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, or at least it was the belief that they could meet the demands of the depositors. And so when that occurs, or when the bank becomes insolvent, when it runs out of capital, or its capital gets so low that uh, it's really a dangerous situation, the, uh, the reg- regulators, the the, if it's a state bank, the, the state and federal regulators get together and conclude that this bank needs to be closed. And if it's a national bank, the, the controller coordinates with the FDIC and concludes that the bank needs to be closed. And as I said earlier, the normal way it goes, it takes place is that there's a, you know ahead of time that this bank is probably going to fail. And so you put out for bid to a group of banks that you know are capable of acquiring the bank that's going to fail or are interested in acquiring the bank that's going to fail. And then when the bank fails, you can immediately transfer. You've got a bid, you take the best bid, or you take the bid that you believe is going to result in the least cost to the FDIC. Because anytime there's a bank failure, there's always going to be a cost to the FDIC. But you, 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 pick, the, you pick the winner of the, of the bidding contest, and you have an ability. Usually, we would close the banks on Friday afternoon. So you do that on Friday. You tell the, the winning bidder, the bank is going to be yours. And then over the weekend, the regulators, the FDIC primarily, and the uh, new owner have enough time over the next couple of days to get ready to open on Monday morning. And on Monday morning, the, the bank opens and the customers don't really know the difference because the acquiring bank takes all of the deposits. So it's not a matter of the federal government protecting the deposits. It's the new bank acquiring the deposit. And then the new bank acquires as many of the assets, the loans and other assets that the bank has, as the FDIC can get them to take. And sometimes they provide an inducement uh, for them to take more assets by saying, we'll split any losses that occur in those assets with you. And then whatever the difference is between what the what the acquiring bank takes and to make the other side of the balance sheet balance, uh, the FDIC makes up in cash. And back in the in the late 80s and early 90s, uh, there were a lot of banks that were more than willing to uh, be on the bid list because they made a lot of money. I mean, they, they could, uh, they, their deposit base was uh, increased substantially. They're, uh, they sometimes picked up branch networks in other, in other communities. And they had the FDIC willing to share losses in the assets. So, you know, whatever they could, whatever they could collect, they did. And what they couldn't collect, they gave back to the, to the FDIC. So it was pretty profitable for a number of those banks. The, the, there wasn't enough time in the case of Silicon Valley and Signature to do that. Because as, as I said, it started on Wednesday, started in earnest on Wednesday and uh, was done by Friday. So there wasn't enough time to do a, uh, a, a sale of the bank. To somebody else. What they did do on uh, Saturday, they formed a, a bridge bank, what's called a bridge bank, which is chartered by the OCC. And you transfer all the assets and all the deposits into the bridge bank. And then you try to find a buyer for the bridge bank. And that's what they did on those two banks. And they have subsequently found a buyer for those two banks. Uh, but they it took a couple of weeks after the bank failed before they were able to get that done. There just wasn't enough time on Saturday and Sunday after the failure for the buyer to come in and make an intelligent decision about how much they were willing to pay and what kind of a loss sharing arrangement they would want and, and other other aspects of the acquisition. So that's why that didn't happen. The, the bridge bank was something, interestingly, that we didn't have available to us in uh, the 80s and, and 90s. That was something that came about much later. And it makes a lot of sense because it gives you another option besides selling the bank before it closes or at the time it closes. You could put it in a bridge bank. That gives you a little bit more time to uh, work it out. So I'm going to ask a difficult question uh, to both of you. So I, it's it's been a few weeks since we've seen these banks close. And interestingly, I think the other day, Jamie Dimon, I think I mentioned this earlier, put out a letter to shareholders in which he said, I don't think the crisis is over. I don't think we're going to see a 2008 crisis, but I don't think the banking crisis is over. Or if it is, there's going to be repercussions for years. But we haven't seen any other banks quote, fail. We've seen Credit Suisse get acquired, and that may have more to do with restatement of, you know, their financials and just kind of maybe some bad timing there. I, I, I don't know for sure. But, um, you know, what is your, what do both of your sense of the, the current strength of the the U.S. banking system? And and specifically, has there been a, you know, will, you know, in, in, with regard to smaller regional community banks, ha, have we seen a, a, a change in 
their deposits and, and the type of business as a result of this. And I think it's worth kind of noting it's early April when we record this, mm-hmm. so we will see, you know, what develops. But at least from my perspective and the banks that I deal with, you know, customers, my belief is that, you know, customers, particularly commercial customers with large deposits might have been concerned early after the failure of Silicon Valley Bank, community banks, mid-sized community banks. um, Some of our clients put together, you know, what I would call kind of pitch books, so to speak, that try to address why that bank is different from Silicon Valley Bank you know, and hitting on the liquidity and the uninsured deposit base and and why they're different and why the customer should feel comfortable leaving uninsured deposits at the bank. You know, Silicon Valley Bank and others have invested in, you know, if, if held to maturity, very safe assets, right? As Bob pointed out, you know, U.S. government bonds, treasury bonds. The problem with those as demonstrated is, is, you know, they, although there's no credit risk, there is interest rate risk. And if you have to sell those bonds early and don't hold them to maturity, you can incur losses if, if you need to sell them to, to create cash, to pay depositors and, and all that. You know, the government has stepped in to uh, provide some liquidity for, you know, for banks to, to use and to, in effect, get 100% on those securities, you know, my, my sense is, I don't know if the crisis has passed, but at least over the past few weeks, it's, it's certainly subsided. But I think that Will is exactly right. There don't seem to be any big withdrawals taking place in all the banks. There has been some erosion of deposits in some of the community banks. There has been some transfer into the money center banks and the regional banks, but but not uh, as much as I think people were afraid there might be. One of the interesting things is that I think that I really disagree with the people who say that when you protect all the depositors like we did, that you essentially establish a precedent for doing it anytime there's a bank failure. Well, that's not really true. I think that in this, this was a very unusual case. And uh, the as I think most people know, the, the decision was made to protect all the depositors because it was believed to be a systemic problem. If we hadn't protected all the depositors, if, the, if, the, if there hadn't been an agreement over the weekend to protect them all, I think Monday would have been very, very unpleasant. And very and very risky, and so I think this is kind of an unusual one-off situation. And, and the Secretary of the Treasury said as much that uh, this was in no way was this sending a signal that we're going to protect everybody all the time. The people who objected to, to our doing that, and there were a lot of people who objected to it, a lot of politicians and a lot of economists and others who have always objected to protecting uninsured depositors. They say, well, you're just creating an environment where bankers feel comfortable taking a lot of risk. And you've got these so-called too big to fail banks that uh, the government will always protect. And uh, you've got an opportunity for abuse and and management of the banks don't feel like they, they have to worry about risk. Well, that's just not true. Because when the bank fails, it doesn't get bailed out. Everybody said, oh, well, the government bailed out Silicon Valley and they bailed out uh, Signature. But they didn't either because the shareholders of Silicon Valley and Signature lost every bit of money they had invested in the bank. Yeah. There were there were unsecured debts issued that had been issued by the bank and by the holding company. It remains to be seen whether the holding company debt is going to be left alone or not. The individuals who were running the bank lost their jobs. All the board members were removed. The bank did fail. And and to me, that is, you know, any banker worth his or her salt is, is not going to want their reputation ruined by having a bank failure that they were running. And so I just don't think that you have a lot of people running around out there who think, well, there's no risk in, in uh, doing whatever I want with my bank. As a consequence, I think that there has been a lot of attention paid over the last three weeks to by everybody who has any kind of imbalance in their liquidity ratios to get it fixed. And as I said earlier, you can do it by swaps. You can do it by selling a portion of it. There's now a, a facility that the government has made available where you can borrow money from the Fed uh, at par value so you don't take a loss uh, on your collateral. You don't have to sell your existing bonds and you don't take a loss. A lot of people object to that, but I mean, it, it's a secured it's a secured loan by the Fed and it's designed to stabilize the system. So I really, uh, I think there has been a lot of attention being paid uh, over the last three weeks to fixing any banks that were at risk. I think also in the case of community banks, there's a 
there are two or three different facilities that they can make available to their customers where if you have a, a large deposit that is more than the insured amount, uh, the $250,000 amount, you, the bank will place $250,000 worth of deposit in any num- in however many banks it takes to cover your deposit. You have immediate ability to withdraw the money. Each, each individual deposit is insured for $250,000. And uh, you pay the bank, the community bank or whatever bank is doing, is doing it, you pay them a small fee for that. But that is a way that a community bank, the customers of a community bank can feel perfectly comfortable that all of their deposits are insured. And and I think a number of community banks, Bill, I mean, Will, don't you think, uh, I, I would guess that some of our community bank clients are already doing that. But if they aren't doing it, that's something that we probably ought to point out to them that they, they, should, uh, they should offer that because it's very popular yeah. and it works. Yeah. And it's for some of these, I, I know it's, I guess a couple of observations. First, with respect to the actions the government took and the regulators took around Silicon Valley Bank and in in effect covering the uninsured deposits and creating the liquidity program for banks. As Bob said, some of that's been criticized by by folks as a bailout. Um, at least in my own view, it's certainly not a bailout of the bank. It it did protect depositors. Uh, but we don't really know what would have happened on Monday or Tuesday with the other banks, right? right? And it 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 wasn't intended, I think, to kind of prop up Silicon Valley Bank. It was intended to prevent, you know, some sort of contagion or systemic issues with other banks right. where, you know, there were would would be runs on those banks of people moving money to what might be perceived as safer banks, and at least it it appears that uh, that 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 worked at least in the over the last several weeks. And you know, as a practical matter, it's not for commercial customers um, that are you know meeting payroll and have sweep accounts and collecting funds every day from customers. It's very easy to go over the uninsured limit, right? right. Because you're running a business, and you know you can have millions of dollars now. You know, I I know one thing that's been talked about is should FDIC insurance be provided kind of for all deposits? And, I, you know, I don't know what will happen with that. I don't know if Bob has a perspective on that or what other reforms might be coming. I don't think they'll do that, but I think there may be some pressure to increase the size of the of the insurance on each deposit hmm. from 250 to something else. Well, and it's going to be interesting to see. I mean, there's, I mean, kind of bringing it back to kind of government enforcement, white collar issues. Uh, I'm sure Seth and I, at some point in the future, will be talking about, you know, kind of the fallout from this, right? I mean, we, we know that the Department of Justice and the SEC have opened investigations, at least as to Silicon Valley. There's, you know, a, as you normally see, there are class action lawsuits that were filed. But that was that was inevitable. Um, but there's also been, you know, interestingly, some focus on some, you know, profits and st- stock sales that were made by management. And those were made pursuant to 10B51 plans, which will can correct me <laughs> if I butchered this, but essentially they're, you know, plans you can put into place where you kind of have a predetermined time period or criteria for selling stock. And it's meant because a lot of times management is very seldomly not in possession of material non-public information that would prevent them from going out and selling. So they have to have a vehicle, you know, to go ahead and to buy and sell those securities. But there, those, those, those securities were sold under 10B51 plans. But interestingly, those plans, I think, were instituted, at least the ones that involved the sales that we're talking about, they were instituted in late January. So that would have been after the management had been meeting with bank examiners and there you know, has been at least one recent case from the SEC in which they brought insider trading claims against an executive who sold um, stock through a 10B51 plan because the point there was you can't have a 10B51 plan in place if you're in possession of material, not public information. But since the SEC has actually come out with new rules and now there's a 90 day cooling off period, in other words, you know, even if you have a 10B51 plan, which interestingly is affirmative defense, it's not a complete a get out of jail free card as they may call it, but It's an affirmative defense to insider trading claim, but now there's going to be a 90 day cooling off period as well, kind of unrelated to these banks. But I mean, of course, the SEC has kind of 
use what happened there as a, an example of why they have this period of where you can't have any sales within 90 days of the, of the plan and it limits the amount of plans that executives can have. Um, but I, I guess, Will and Bob, I mean, do you see, you know, separate and apart from whatever enforcement actions that there may be, and this may be a really tough question, I mean, do you see there being a change, fundamental change in regulation of banks as a result of this? Or do you think that these are, I think what we've talked about is kind of more one-offs and maybe more focus on the mm-hmm. banking regulators being a little bit more stringent and, and perhaps being a little bit more stringent and fast to act with regard to other banks? Well, definitely, I think that there will probably be hearings and there will probably be examiners who are put up on the on the chopping block <laughs> and criticized. And as several examiners told me when I used to tell them, look, don't be so defensive. Don't take your concerns out on the banks. Don't be unreasonable in the way you treat the banks as, a, as your regulator. I'll be the one that takes the heat if the a bank fails or somebody doesn't like what the OCC does, I'll be up there testifying before Congress and I will take the blame. You 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 just get in there and do your job and do it do it right. But that of course is a little bit idealistic because when when Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank failed, everybody wants to get in on the act. The regulators of course are you know they they want right. to uh, they they want to get to the bottom of it and they want to find out what happened pretty obvious what happened. It just didn't act, didn't act promptly enough. But the Congress, of course, every every committee that has any possible jurisdiction over this wants to get involved. The SEC wants to get involved. The CFPB wants to get involved. And so there's going to be a lot of pressure to change the rules and regulations. There's been a lot of criticism. When Randy Quarles was the vice chairman of the Fed for bank supervision, he tried to take a more reasonable approach to some of the things that were put in place under the Dodd-Frank Act back several years ago. And one of the things he did was say that banks from $100 billion to $250 billion in asset size did not have to have some of the strict stress tests and capital require, extra capital requirements and so on that the banks larger than $250 billion had to have. And um, he's gotten a lot of criticism about that in the last three weeks. And the Fed's gotten a lot of criticism and said, you know, we've got to go back to the days that anybody over $100 billion in asset size is subject to the same rules as the banks over $250 billion. So there's going to be a lot of pressure for that. As I said, there'll be pressure to increase the size of the the amount of deposit insurance on account. There'll be uh, some some people will be saying we ought to insure all deposits. Other people will be saying we ought to we don't want to insure deposits of rich people. So, okay, well, who is a rich person? I mean, it's just, it's going to be a circus for a while. Uh, well, everybody, you know, tries to get their, their little piece of, of, of attention for this. But I think... So like government, uh, you know, status quo, right? Yes, yes. As far as the banking system goes, I think the banking system is in extraordinarily good shape. All the banks have a lot of capital. And capital wasn't the problem with with Silicon Valley Bank or or uh, Signature Bank. Uh, the problem was liquidity, hmm. and and the problem was public confidence, and the problem was the social media, and it, it just it, it you got a stampede going, and it, it was it's very difficult to stop a yeah. stampede. Yeah, yeah. Just to add on to what Bob said, there's obviously a discussion around new regulation and you know, what, sh- what else should we do and that sort of thing. I think, you know, I do think it's kind of helpful to step back and recognize what Bob said earlier, which is the examiners knew about the liquidity issue and the mismatch in assets and liabilities in the percent of uninsured deposits and the things that led to what happened, right? So it's, it's not as if um, the examinations failed. It, it's more, at least in my mind, it's more a matter of, that the examiners, the regulators didn't maybe push hard enough to to have corrective action taken and that the management either didn't take action or didn't take action quickly enough or didn't didn't take it seriously. I don't I don't really have insight into into what their thinking was. But you know, but there is I wouldn't say the system worked, but you know, there was there was oversight. It just failed to cause the bank to take the action it should have taken. Will is exactly right. You know, we don't need any more regulation. The regulators have plenty of authority to do whatever they want to do. In fact, some people think they have too much. We have plenty of regulations. We have all kinds of requirements that banks have to meet. And personally, I think we do have too many 
of those, particularly as it relates to the community bank, because as I said way back at the beginning, you know, all these things, all this compliance that is required of community banks is expensive. Mm. And they have to they have to have they have to hire people to come in and fill out forms and send reports in and do all kinds of things that don't produce any income whatsoever for them. All they are is just expenses. And uh, you burden the community banks down with too much of that, which I think we have done. And you've got a lot of bankers who just say, you know, I quit. Uh, come by me, please. And that's not good for the communities that they're located in. Well, I guess to to kind of wrap things up, is is there any kind of lessons learned that you know, our clients who are in the industry and, and community banking or, or other banks, any any kind of takeaways of lessons learned or, or, or what we may think that they need to be thinking about in the future? It's going to sound like I'm still wearing my regulator hat, but, <laughs> but I would say that if you're on a bank board and uh, or if you're a banker, pay attention to what your regulator tells you. If you if you disagree with what the regulator is telling you, uh, there are all kinds of avenues for voicing that disagreement and getting that worked out. But I don't see how in this particular case, for these two banks, anybody could disagree with what the causes of it were. And they just didn't pay attention to what their regulator was telling them. And the regulator didn't follow up on what he was telling them. And um, that's, that's not good. But we don't need more a whole bunch more regulations. That's the, the last thing we need. But we're probably going to get some. Somebody's got to be able to say, "Well, we did something." Yeah. Sometimes not doing anything is uh, the better policy. And it, and it sounds like you know perhaps maybe you know a resetting of expectations with you know when you do get those regulators giving you comments about maybe how swiftly they were going to act versus maybe how they would have acted in the in the past. You know, there's definitely probably going to be a an emphasis on kind of moving quicker and in kind of enforcement, I, I would imagine, because like you said, nobody nobody wants to be answering questions as to why they didn't move faster on in, enforcing issues during their examination. Well, the other thing I would say is, you know, people need to be more aware of what's going on in the environment that they're operating in. By that, I mean banks, bank, banks and bank management. You know, we haven't had a significant bank failure, as I said, since 2008. We had some doozies in 2008, but 2008 was a long time ago. And I think people have gotten very complacent because everything has been pretty stable and everybody's been making a lot of money and the banks the banks have gotten better capitalized and to their credit, the regulators have, have been good about, about getting them there. But when you have, when inflation hits and you've got the Fed announcing that we're going to do something about stopping it and they start raising interest rates, there ought to be some flashing lights going off saying, what are the implications of this for our bank? And I mean, it should be, it so, sounds uh, so obvious, but it is obvious that when when you have interest rates going up, the value of your bond portfolio is going to go down. And you know what your bond portfolio is, and you know why you bought it. And it's very easy to manage and estimate what the value of it's going to become with each in, with each increase. In interest rate. And so why in the world you don't do something about it while you still have a chance to do that is just beyond me and beyond anybody else that I've been able to talk to about this. Everybody just says, you know, this is banking 101. What, what were these people thinking? Well, hopefully people will kind of take notice and, and not let, you know, kind of history repeat itself here. Well, well, thank you both for joining us. Really interesting discussion, you know, and, and Bob, you know, with your very unique and incredible background and uh, kind of overseeing the uh, significant banking crisis. You know, appreciate your insights here. Great episode, and and we'll see. You know, maybe how this falls out, and and maybe get back together as we see how what kind of regulations and perhaps government enforcement come of this. But thank you for joining us today for this episode of Sidebar. You can get this episode and all others not only from the Bracewell website, but from anywhere else you get podcasts.